and sages, uh, David Gergen and Ken Blanchard. Um, I will take a moment um, and report back on uh, the results of your input. Uh, first, your vote on the original 44 questions, and then some of the new questions you submitted. Um, and then uh, David and Ken will offer some of their own concluding thoughts and engage a number of you, uh, in fact, invite a number of you to share some of your thoughts of the day. Um, you should have received on your table, uh, we did this in a little bit of a hurry, but you should have received on everybody's table one copy of 15 questions, which were the top vote getters from the original uh, 44 questions submitted. And can we get that up on the screen? Okay, this, this will be submitted, this, this will be displayed for you in two screens. Uh, here are the first seven, and I think what's striking, let me give everyone a chance to just take a look first. I think what's most striking here is we had 77% agreement across the 22 decision-making teams uh, on five of the questions. And if you look at them, they, they span the, the range of uh, the kinds of um, questions that you asked about, uh, that, that our five panelists asked about, from uh, competencies, uh, like team building, for example, um, to values that were emphasized by Bill George and uh, Wilson Good, for example. So there really is quite a diversity here. Uh, can we go to the second slide, which shows the next eight most popular questions? So again, you've got these on your tables to take a look at further, and I'm sure David and Ken will come back to at least some of them. Uh, but what I want to do at this point is also show you um, a sampling of some of the new questions that your groups came up with that were not on the original list. If we can have that slide, please. And you submitted a total of 34 new questions, and this is a sampling of nine. Uh, our editorial group that considered these questions that you submitted uh, were extraordinarily impressed by the substantive quality of the questions uh, that you submitted. And what these nine reflect is, more than anything else, uh, these were nine questions that were deemed by our editorial group to fill in gaps, to be complementary to the other 15 questions. Uh, so what we're going to do in the uh, next week or so is with our editorial team at CPL and Blanchard um, is we are going to start from the 15 questions that you voted as the most popular, take into account these new questions that you submitted, and try to strengthen the overall list uh, while keeping them manageable in number. And then we're going to work very hard to get these actually posed to the candidates uh, and keep you apprised of uh, that process. At this point, let me turn it over to David and to Ken. I'm not sure I like to be considered a white old, old sage, or at least, uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, today has really been an amazing experience uh, for me, just listening. I, I'm a learner, you know. I, I think we ought to lead with our ears more. Uh, I've never heard anybody who got fired for listening too much. Uh, but uh, I was really kind of fascinated. It seems to me, as I listened, there was three main areas of concern where we looked at character and questions. I um, mean, when we looked at, uh, uh, yeah, the, the qualities of people and, and the questions. And one is character, the whole issue around what are your values, who are you, those kinds of issues. The second is what's your vision, what's your sense of, of where the country might go. And then third is a lot of questions around how are you going to implement this stuff? How are you going to operate? And when I hear those three things, it kind of comes back to me always, 
when I talked to you in the beginning about leading at a higher level, it seems to me that we're talking today about needing a servant leader. And when I hear people, you know, talk about servant leadership or mention it, a lot of people say, oh my God, here we go. The inmates are going to run the prison. Uh, you want to please everybody. Uh, you know, this is some kind of religious movement. And, you know, Robert Glean Greenleaf, when he defined servant leadership, said a servant leader serves first and leads second. And a lot of people can't quite understand that. And the reason I think most people don't understand it that I'd like to leave you to think about today is that there's really two parts of leadership. I have never gotten involved in the argument between leadership and management. Because whenever I hear people talk about doing some leadership and management, management always takes a second fiddle and sounds like it's not very important. It seems to me that there's two parts of leadership. The first is, is the visionary direction, strategic part of leadership. And this is the leadership part of servant leadership. Because leadership's about going somewhere. Where are we going to go? And I think we need a president who is going to be able to conjure up a vision, a positive vision, that says that this country really has a future and we're really going to go uh, somewhere. And I think we need a visionary leader. And that's the leadership part, to me, of servant leadership. But the second part is how you're going to accomplish it. And this is when you get to the servant part of servant leadership. And the way you accomplish this, and this takes a particular humbled uh, person to realize, is after the vision is set, you've got to serve, turn the pyramid upside down philosophically, where the president really works for us and not us for him. I think what we have known in this country and in other countries, in business, churches, all that, too much self-serving leadership where everybody thinks, you know, the people at the top, they're the ones that determine it all. I think we ought to be focusing on a leader who can set a great vision and then get out of the way, in a sense, and become a cheerleader, supporter, and encourager and all. And the big difference is when leaders leave the traditional pyramid high, up right side up, they act like, we can do it, you can help. And what I would love to do, and I hear a lot of it coming out of here, is a president that's going to say, you can do it, we can help. And I got heard that from these young people. I think we got a lot of people in this country that really want to help, but they don't know how to help because what happened in the past is leadership has been too much traditionally hierarchical and not enough about servant leadership. And when I look at this whole issue, it comes back to me to say, okay, we need the leadership part of servant leadership. We need a clear vision, but we need the servant part. And that's where we're really getting at character and asking those questions. Why are you leading? Are you here to serve or be served? You know, what are those issues? Now, most people aren't going to raise their hand and say, I'm here to, you know, to be served. But watch their behavior. There's three things we look at when we look at people's behavior whether they're a servant leader or a surf set, how do they deal with feedback? If people get defensive when they get feedback, we know they're self-serving. Why? Because when you give them negative feedback, they think you don't want them to lead, and they think they own their position. Where servant leaders think that their position is on loan, and so if you give them feedback, their first answer is, thank you, could you tell me more? I need to hear more, because that was not my intention. I want to hear more. A second way we know somebody's self-serving is if they don't want anybody else around them to look good. I want to tell you, I would recommend all of you to read Team of Rivals, and I'm sorry that Doris Kearns couldn't make it here, because it's pretty amazing to see the personality of Abraham Lincoln, who everyone described as magnanimous. He took rivals who hated each other and him because he believed that it's amazing how much you can get done when you don't hit, get who care who gets the credit. And so I think that's a really important thing. Are you willing to let other people look good around you? And I'm sick and tired of vice presidents just standing around waiting for something to happen. We ought to have vice presidents who are major players and really can contribute and are part of the team and you want to make them look good. The third way that we know if somebody's self-serving is if all their focus is on results and outcome. Are they going to get elected again? Are they? And they don't care about the process. 
I would really love to see some leaders who said, whatever comes, comes. My self-worth isn't based on my performance plus the opinion of others. What my, my, my self-worth comes from, my belief that I'm here to serve, not to be served, and I'm trying to do the best for the greatest number uh, here. And so I really love to hear a lot of stuff coming out of here and love to hear your response. But I think what we're talking about today with character, vision, and implementation is we need a servant leader. Good. As we close here today, I, first of all, I want to thank all of you for being here and uh, participating. And, and I'm really uh, deeply impressed you're still here. This is terrific. It's, and I think, it, I think it reflects a lot on the quality of the day. I, I just want to say to how uh, pleased I was that you all had an opportunity to hear from students. Uh, because I think you could tell in the quality of the students you heard why many of us are inspired to be here. They, they, each one of them goes to one of the public service schools at the graduate level here at Harvard. We consider our three, the, 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 the School of Education, School of Public Health, and the Kennedy School to be the three public service schools here, and they represented that wide gamut. Uh, and uh, I, I think, I, I hope you also appreciate all five have been on scholarships they might not be able to do this and come to a public service school and prepare themselves for public service were it not for the generosity uh, of donors. And some of those donors are here in the room and we just want to thank you for what you're doing. The more we build up these scholarship programs, the more we believe we can attract really talented people to go into to public service. It's very hard to go into public service if you're carrying a debt $100,000, $150,000 coming out. If you can, we can get these scholarships in, and that's what uh, you know. Uh, people here have been so helpful on uh, Bill and Penny George, the George Foundation, the Zuckerman Fellows, the Reynolds Fellows, these other fellowships that we've been building up. We're so uh, we're so grateful to those of you who have supported that. And you think about these these students. They didn't, you know, they, Andrew didn't say much about his commitment to, you know, to go back to Ghana. Uh, and to work with technology uh, coming out of the School of Education to really uh, lift the levels of, uh, of literacy there. Elizabeth didn't really talk about the fact that she volunteered to go to Baghdad and work in the public health ministry there. Someone was going to medical school, she could have lived a very safe life. No, that she went, she went to Baghdad as a civilian uh, to, to help out. Patrick didn't tell you that he graduated number one in his class at West Point and was also the first cadet. Those are two signal honors in the senior class there. Only six, only six times in 100 years has one person won both. Patrick did that. He's now come here to the business school, the Kennedy School. After finishing his, his service, he's going back to Texas. He's going to get a private equity firm, and he and I have talked several times about his desire to get into public life. One day, I hope he's going to come back here. Uh, Andy Card can come here and support him as a, as a major public official out of, out of Texas. I think that'll, we'll all be looking forward uh, to that day. Chris didn't tell you, among all the other things, uh, that he is now in the finals for a White House fellowship uh, after uh, coming out of this school. Uh, Chris, see Andy Card before you leave. Um, <laughs> uh, those select that selection process is coming to a head. We've got Paula who's here, who's another finalist in the White House fellowship uh, uh, program, and Shannon Music, who is uh, is just such a has been such an inspiration here uh, for us at the school through her. Yeah, you know, she's going to go back to Costa Rica. Uh, and bring the spirit of social entrepreneurship that you've heard a lot about today, uh, that so many of these young people are committed to social change. And, and it's, it's a, a privilege for us to, for them to be here in our midst. It gives all of us a great sense of hope about the longer term. Um, and uh, you know, the earlier they can, we can get them into public service and the position of real uh, leadership, I think all of us will feel uh, good about that. So we appreciated the fact that you had a chance to hear that. Now, um, I think as we close, it would, be, it would be helpful to hear from a few of you uh, reflections upon the day. Uh, and we've asked a, 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 a few of you to say that, but I also would invite volunteers. Uh, but there, I hope there's a microphone passing around. There's one here. And I'd like to start by asking Betsy Myers uh, to offer some reflections. You should know that two years ago, we had something similar to this, and it was in honor of Warren Bennis. And Betsy was then the executive director uh, of this center. 
uh, and she really put together this tribute to Warren Bennis that we had in this same room uh, that w was uh, really wonderful. And, and Betsy has, who became inspired about the ideas, a Kennedy School graduate, became inspired about the ideas of leadership, uh, left the school about, uh, what was it, almost a year ago now, Betsy? 16 months. 16 months ago. And then Donna became the executive director, and, but Betsy, Betsy went to the Obama campaign. And this is when Obama was at about 20% name recognition. Ten. And she, ten. <laughs> <laughs> and she, was, uh, she became the chief operating officer to build this $100 million startup uh, and has been out in Chicago and, uh, and more recently has become a chairwoman of the uh, uh, women for Obama's out speaking. Uh, as a surrogate, and she's not here to wear an Obama hat per se, but really to talk about leadership uh, and what she's learned coming from the school out into the arena and how you see it apply. Because Andy Card talked about how important it was to move from theoretical to practical. Tell us your reflections, Betsy, as the day ends. It's We're great to, to be here. here. Thank you. It's great to be here. And uh, I felt like uh, coming today, like I was coming home to a place I've spent seven plus years here at Harvard and work closely with David and Donna and others uh, around here in, in the center. And, you know, I, I was sitting here remembering, it's just hard to believe, to the day that we celebrated Warren Bennis um, and his contribution to leadership two years ago, May 11, 2006. And so what came out of that conference two years ago was, I was really taken with it, how the conversation was about, as Ken was talking about, servant leadership, about leadership of the heart, about being authentic, about being able to build <coughs> coalitions, trust. Um, and it's almost like it was like this new thinking about leadership where, you know, gone is command and control leadership and in is this different kind of leadership. And at the same time, the work we've been doing in our center was opening this conversation to that leadership is really about personal and interpersonal leadership development and it's knowing who you are and your blind spots. And so that was the midst of everything that I had been doing at, at Harvard and at the center. So when Barack Obama came onto the stage, I was fascinated with him uh, because of the different kind of leadership qualities that he brought to the table. Uh, and about how he, how he was different and how he led and, and, uh, and how he thought about leadership. So after that conference, David and I actually went and took 25 students, I think Zuckerman students, to his office. And uh, he had 15 minutes or so with us. And what he chose to share with us was, uh, and I always found this fascinating, because you have 15 minutes with kids, you know, students, what are you going to talk about? And what Barack talked about was, the leadership lessons he learned when he ran against Bobby Rush and lost. And I remember thinking, that is so authentic. And then he, in the way Brock has great sense of humor, which came up today, I don't know if you remember this, David, but he, after he told us the lessons he lost, he said, well, you know, then, you know, you have to remember I had no money. I wanted to go to the Democratic Convention. I went to the airport, tried to buy a ticket. My credit card was maxed out. And then on top of that, my wife was furious at me. So it was a low point. And I remember thinking, you know, that's so authentic. It's just being comfortable in who you are. Because this whole thing and all the work that Bill George has done, <coughs> I've always been, uh, I've thought so much about that. It's, we know in leaders, those that we're comfortable with, those that are authentic and comfortable they're in their own skin. So that's what I was taken with Barack um, and uh, about just being comfortable in his own skin. And so the questions that we're talking about today are so important. Uh, they need to go on the agenda. They need to go on what we're talking about with our candidates and, and, our, and with our leaders. Uh, because I'll tell you, as I have been in this campaign, I spent a year in Chicago putting the nuts and bolts together, but I've spent the last five months on the road. I've been through 12 or 13 states, and I've been doing town hall meetings, house parties, uh, I've talked to hundreds of voters. And what's interesting about the Democratic primary is that you have two candidates who are very similar in what they want to do. They want to get out of the war, they want to reform health care, they want to reform education, deal with the energy crisis. <coughs> so what you're really talking about here is leadership skills. And so that's what I've been talking about with voters for the last five months. And you know what? What's fascinating? They're fa they are so interested in that. Because when I talk about Barack, I talk about the leadership skills that he has. Because, you know, as we were talking about today, this implementation, this is, this is the thing. I mean, what, what I learned, I, and I worked in the Clinton administration, 
and I have great respect for, for uh, the Clintons. But what I learned in my seven years that a president is remembered for the legislation they were able to get passed. I mean, bully pulpit is really important. An executive order, there's so much you can do by ordering your cabinet secretary. So what are the leadership skills that you bring to the White House that enables you to actually get legislation passed? That's what I don't think voters totally understand. They think, well, we just put forward a health care proposal. So if, that, if Hillary or uh, McCain or Barack becomes the next president, they're just going to take that proposal and get it passed. And I lived through 1994 with Hillary Clinton's attempt on health care, and it's not an easy thing to get done. So what are the leadership skills that we're talking about? So all of these things that, we're, that we have discussed today are critical. And, you know, I will tell you something, and this is, you know, in this room, we, Ken, called me in my early days and said, let's have a conversation with Barack uh, on leadership skills, and we'll do them with each of the candidates on CNN with Larry King. And, you know, I'm sharing this with all of you because I think it's important to know that it's going to take a lot of us to get this on the agenda. Our campaign at that time said no to that because they thought it was too, um, talking about leadership skills was a little too um, soft. Soft. And actually, it's such the opposite, and that's what I've been, com that's what I've been confir confirmed as I've traveled around the country. Actually, people do want to know. And I'm talking people, and these are people in, I don't care if it's in, in living rooms in New Hampshire or I've just was in small towns in Kentucky. They do want to know. What, does, does, does Barack listen? You know, does he build coalitions? How's he going to get the work done? How does he build a team? How does he treat people? You know, and I have some inside stories to share about Barack you know, because I've observed it up close and personal. So I'm able to tell stories about, you know, what I've observed, he's very calm. You know, and Andy, you will, uh, Andy Card, you will know, um, you, will, you will like this actually. In my interview with Barack Obama, and he's, in the beginning days, he said, um, he asked, he wanted me to be his COO, and he said, I want to run our campaign uh, with three things. And he'd studied George Bush's 2000 campaign. He said, I want to run our campaign like a business, like George Bush ran his 2000 campaign. And, uh, and then he said, I want to also run our campaign with respect. Respect for our voters, our staff, our donors. And the third thing, I want to run our campaign with low drama. Now, run it like a business with respect and low drama. I think that's, that, that is why I went to work for Barack. Because I was like, you know what? Even if he doesn't win and he's 10% in name ID in the polls, if we could actually run a campaign like that, then that's history making. So these are the issues. You know, it's about, it's about implementation. What are these skills? Who are you? And just in closing, uh, on the auth authenticity is such an important part. I mean, the American voters are smart. They know when they're looking up there on the news. They can see if someone's authentic. And just quickly, between the three candidates, I just want to tell a quick little New Hampshire story. Um, when Hillary Clinton cried, that was authentic. And you know what? She should have done, not that she should have cried a lot more, but when Hillary showed who she really was, people were, they, they responded to that. And, you know, that, that's the tough thing. How do you as a candidate really show who you are? So people, because that's trust. When people feel like they trust you. And so being able to do that. When John McCain, when he was counted out, I love this about him. He was counted out, he got that little backpack on, got on an airplane by himself, went to New Hampshire, and gutted it out in rooms all over New Hampshire with 30 people. It was embarrassing, and he, and he plowed through it. That's, you know, that's how John McCain, he's authentic. And the last thing in Barack, when we lost New Hampshire, that's where I really got to see what Barack Obama was all about, because we were really up in the polls. We were going to 17, 18 points. Everyone was saying we were going to win New Hampshire. Our internal polling was showing 10, and we lost by two. And I remember thinking, how are you going to handle this, Brock? And how are you going to handle it? And it was really when I saw who he was, his authentic self of who he was, you know, by going inward and saying, not blaming anybody on our staff, going inward, saying, what did we learn from this team? You know, we were like Icarus flying too high to the sun. And he pulled back and said, you know, never again are we going to listen to Paul's team. And, but the, what I've learned from that, he was calm. And he said, what did we learn? And we're never going to do that again. And stay with me. And so you, those, these are the things that I think as candidates, you know, how authentic they are.
is such a big piece of it. So everything you all talked about today, I feel like I was thinking, yes, yes, because those, that, that's what these qualities, the American people deserve to have this conversation about these traits and about how are we really going to get the work done? Because that's what you're really talking about when you're talking about the new elect. How, what is the, on their top of their agenda and how are they going to get that work done? And that's about their leadership skills. Thank you, Betsy. And good luck. <clears throat> I'm, I'm glad that uh, Betsy also brought in uh, uh, Mrs. Clinton and John McCain in that conversation. I, I think it should be said and the record should show, I think one of the attractions that people have for John McCain uh, in this campaign, one of the reasons he's doing as well as he is doing, given the tough landscape in which he finds himself, uh, is that people are relating to it on his authenticity. I think they do find that there's something there that is real, given the experiences he's had uh, and the valor that he's shown. Uh, there is a quality about him, you know, that nothing in life he'll ever face will ever be as tough as what he's been through already. And so he, he takes life in stride, uh, and he seems to be a person who is extremely well anchored. And I think people relate to that. And I, I, one of the things that's coming out of this campaign is how much people are in search of someone they can relate to and, and whose values they can share. And I think that that's what's made this such a, a compelling race in many ways. Um, I, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, there are a few more here. I'd like to go to Gordy Zacks. Where's Gordy Zacks? There's Gordy Zacks, who has been close to a number of Republican presidents, has written a book about leadership, has been here and worked with our students in a wonderful, wonderful way, running workshops that they've gotten a great deal out of. Gordy, we're delighted to have you here. Thank you. Uh, I, I was thinking this morning, uh, when we were talking about the crisis, and the nature of the problems facing America and the world. Uh, what would George Washington have said if he and his team had been on this platform? Because when you read about that period, that Revolutionary War period, there was no way that we should have won that war. No way that we should have been able to form a country. No way that the Constitutional Convention should have ever succeeded. And it succeeded because of leadership. And it succeeded because of George Washington's leadership. Fought that war for eight years. The, the richest man in America was home in Mount Vernon three days in eight years. He led by example. He was at the front. He was with the troops. He was there. And he was the only one who could bring all of these disparate forces together and unify them under the common vision of building a nation built on liberty and freedom. And when I thought about the first session, and then I thought about the last session that we just had, I thought about the Chinese symbol for crisis. And one piece of it is danger. And the other piece of it is opportunity. And we started the session with the danger, with the articulation of all the challenges facing this great country and the world. <coughs> and then we ended the session with hope and optimism and belief and passion and a willingness to go and do and a message. To me, the big message that came out of the whole day was the message of the power of one. What one person with passion and commitment and desire can do to make the world a better place. And the challenge for the next president is what you said earlier. It's to empower. It's to encourage people, to enable people to go out and do. Just do it. Just begin where you can make a difference. Just go and do it. And a great man who had a tremendous impact on me and on the world once said to me a very profound but very simple thought, which I believe is relevant to the message coming out of this convocation. And it was, if you want to change the world, change yourself. Go and begin and do what you can do to make the world a better place. And together, we can make it happen. Thank you, Gordy. <clears throat> see, 
Werner Erhard is here, over here on the, uh, who has uh, been an, an inspiration and a leadership guru, if one may call it that, for people both in the United States and in Europe for a long, long time. David, thanks. And uh, what, where I'm left is with a very powerful sense of thanks for a truly unique uh, experience. And uh, I certainly want to thank the Kennedy School and the, uh, and the, and the uh, Ken Blanchard companies for a brilliant uh, program. And uh, I, I, uh, I think I could speak for everyone in the room in saying that after the last session, I feel like I'm in good hands and I leave the meeting with a lot of optimism. So thank you for all the, uh, the uh, people who were on the panels. It was really great. Terrific. Thank you, Werner. Uh, Francis, uh, there's another microphone. Francis Heselbein is here. Uh, Francis is legendary uh, for her leadership efforts, stretching back to the Girl Scouts. Uh, and she's with the, with the uh, They've been with the Drucker Foundation and is wrote a book with Eric Shinseki. She writes books with everybody. I, I, she she writes faster than I can read. Francis, good to see you. Thank you very much. In our packets, we have one of the greatest gifts we could have received. In addition to all the profound thinkers and speakers, David Gergen has given us National Leadership Index. When I received this in 2007, it became my constant companion. And twice a week, no matter what the group is I'm speaking to, I'm able to tell them that when you look at the leadership confidence of the people in our country, number one is the military. Number two is medical, doctors, nurses, hospitals. And number three is the Supreme Court. Number four is education. Number five, all of the nonprofit uh, charitable organizations. Now, which great institutions, which great leaders are at the bottom of the list? The congressional leadership, the executive branch, the presidency, and the press. Now that is a great tragedy, that they would be at the bottom. But this is the context of our discussion today. We're very grateful for this. And it was fascinating. We've talked about Warren Bennis, but he was in the room because when Reverend Good got up and talked about, but what is in your heart? There was Warren saying, the leader within, that's what we have to understand. And so it has been uh, an amazing day and we're very grateful. And I think that around our table, all the tables, even though we talked about the imperatives of leadership, of the presidency, in the end, we talked about the quality and character of the leader. What are your values? Thank you very much. Thank you, Francis. <clears throat> if we could bring that microphone over to Walter Yaloa. Uh, Walter is the uh, president of Intervision Communication Corporation. He is a new friend here uh, at the Kennedy School who is helping us to uh, launch a program uh, for young Hispanic leaders, something we think is very important part of our commitment here at the school. We're trying to launch two programs. We launched a program for women in leadership about three years ago. We want one for Hispanic leadership and we want one for African American leadership. We think those are all important commitments and Walter is making possible uh, the program uh, on Hispanic leadership. Thank you. Well, thank you, David. Um, I'd like to first start by uh, thanking uh, the Center uh, for Public Leadership for, uh, for organizing this remarkable day. Uh, David, Andy, Donna, Kathy, and all the other people that went, uh, that are involved in, in organizing uh, today's uh, forum. Um, I, I think it's fair to say that we all agree that um, 
the um, issues facing the next president are, are big, uh, important, and complex. And uh, I, I believe it's been terrific uh, to spend the day with all of you and uh, to reflect and, and probe um, the leadership uh, qualities and attribute, attributes that are going to be required of the next president. Uh, and, and, and to think about um, the abilities that this next pres president is going, to ha is going to have to have to lead us through the challenges that lie ahead. So I thank all of you for, for spending the day with, uh, with me, and, uh, and it's been a great experience. Thank you, Walter. Thank you. We're, we're delighted to have you here. <clears throat> Marilyn Carlson Nelson, would you like would you honor us with a few words as we as we close it? You should know that Marilyn uh, Carlson Nelson and her husband Glenn, uh, along with the Georges and David Rubenstein, have been instrumental in helping us form a partnership with young global leaders from the World Economic Forum in Davos. Uh, they come here now to the Kennedy School for uh, ex an executive education program on the substantive challenges facing uh, the rising generation as well as the leadership challenges. Rod Kramer heads up the, uh, the leadership work. Mac Max Bazerman, who's here from the business school, has been very involved with uh, teaching this. And we're, we're deeply grateful to you, Marilyn, for your support. Uh, Marilyn, when, when, when she first became uh, CEO of her company, I think it was the first year, arrived on roller skates. She is a wonderfully interesting woman. <laughs> Marilyn. Um, I did that to demonstrate uh, being willing to accept risk and make change, and it was a highly risky thing to do. <laughs> Actually, I called my youngest daughter, who was the courageous one in the family, and told her what I was thinking of doing, and she said, oh, Mom, don't do that. It's way too risky. So, um, but I just think that uh, I'd like to just add my uh, appreciation and also reference further this Young Global Leaders Partnership between uh, the Kennedy School and the um, Harvard School of Business and others who are not only, uh, not only working on leadership, which we've all explored here today, but bringing together these young people from all over the world, many of whom uh, had never had an opportunity to even in some cases visit the United States, but who have demonstrated strong leadership qualifications. And watching them, which I had the privilege to do a few weeks ago, uh, come with excitement, the sense of promise, the sense of what could be, and the sense of how they can reach across national borders, across sovereignties, across jurisdictions, and find that leader that common leader within themselves to create a better world was very inspiring and held as much promise as what we heard here today. So I think for all of us to look to the young to lead us is important. And in our companies, I think many of us have discovered that in order, in fact, to attract young people to the corporate world, which can be an extraordinary power for good, we have to tie in to a greater vision. We have to give them a sense that a corporate, that corporate commitment too can actually be a tool to make change. And that's the kind of environment we need to create so we can continue to learn from each other. Thank you, Marilyn. You should know that Marilyn is, uh, while she was at, at Carlson, running Carlson for uh, a, a decade plus, uh, was uh, really pushed to open up opportunities for women. Uh, and this has been a major commitment of hers for a long time now. And I think when you left, you were up to what percentage of the executives? 43%, which was up sharply from where it been. She, she herself was one of the women when she was coming up early on uh, in, uh, in New York in, the, in, the, in a financial uh, 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 firm there, uh, could not sign her own name uh, to memos. She had to actually sign with her initials so that people would not know that she was a woman. Uh, and now she's been very much fighting 
to reverse that tide and has been very successful at that. I want to introduce someone else to you today from who has been building a university in a very admirable way in my home state of North Carolina and we've become friends and I've just been very supportive of what he's trying to do because he's been introducing leadership development into the curriculum there not only in the undergraduate level but in a new law school. This is Leo Lambert of Elon University who, who is here from North Carolina with a contingent. If there's a microphone uh, there that could be moved over to him. Um, <clears throat> Thank you, David. And we are proud to be welcoming Donna's daughter as an Elon freshman next year. So congratulations <clears throat> to her. If there was a footnote that I'd add to the wonderful conversation today, I think it would be this, that I was surprised that we didn't spend more time talking about what I think is the real crisis in K-12 to education uh, in this nation. When I fly home to North Carolina tonight, uh, we are a state where one in three students will not finish high school. The entire state last year, all the colleges and universities, public and private in North Carolina, did not graduate 10 physics teachers. My future son-in-law graduated with a graduate degree in electrical engineering from North Carolina State University just this past weekend. And the numbers of of those advanced degrees that went to American citizens was very, very low indeed. Um, and when I, when I listen today about the, the challenges ahead of this nation, the opportunities ahead of us in biotechnology, the quest for energy independence, it just strikes me that we need in this nation a Sputnik II, a call again uh, to be great in math and science education. And that is one of my fervent, fervent hopes uh, for our next president. Some applause here, thank you very much. <laughs> I think it'll make a real difference. We cannot ignore the crisis in K-12. Uh, it is imperative that we address it. Thank you. Thank you very, very much for that. Uh, about a year and a half ago, we uh, here at the uh, at, at the at school at our center decided that it would be a really fine idea if there was some way we could honor the military veterans uh, who were here at the Kennedy School and then at the business school. Because uh, we discovered there actually were there were 50 at the Kennedy School and there were 50 at the business school uh, who had come back from Iraq or Af or Afghanistan or both who had served in many cases more than one tour and so we decided to have an evening to honor them. Uh, we, had, uh, we had a color guard, we had a three-star general came up and visited, General Petraeus you know, sent a note, the, the head of the Joint Chiefs sent a video, we just, we, and we just had a wonderful, wonderful evening. Well, the first person to step up and support that uh, was one of our other guests here today, a very dear friend, Richard Krasno, who's here from the Keenan Charitable Trust with a couple of members of his, of his board who came that night and made that night possible. Uh, and, and Dick has been a friend of the center since. We're proud to have him here. Uh, and uh, up from Chapel Hill, another North Carolinian now. We, 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 we embraced, adopted him in North Carolina uh, when he moved. And, uh, uh, but has been a wonderful friend of the center as well. Dick, we would welcome a few words from you. Is there a microphone? There, there you go. A couple of them are coming. <coughs> Thank you, David. It's a particularly <coughs> mean trick for David to ask me about 30 minutes ago to summarize this intense day, especially after all the other great summaries. Um, and uh, also, given the fact that we're 24 minutes, 27 minutes into the cocktail hour, um, I wonder why my good friend David would do this. I've known him for a long time, and I think I've figured out why. I um, know him well enough so that I have been able to tease him um, about the fact, and some of the people here will understand this, that he is somewhat punctuality challenged. Um, <laughs> when I asked him why, he said, um, it's kind of silly to be punctual. There are so few people there to appreciate it. Um, <laughs> But with the understanding that I stand between the people in this room and the, and the uh, cocktail hour, I'm, I really will be brief and somewhat personable. When I, when I uh, understood that uh, some of our support for the center was going to be used for this purpose, I really didn't know what to expect. Um, but David's never uh, disappointed me. 
And so I was absolutely confident that it would be an extraordinarily thoughtful and stimulating day. And I, like you, have not been disappointed. There are three things that I, that I take away of, of so many that I could mention. Um, at the beginning of the day, our panels rehearsed the notion that this election may be the most important in generations. And then, of course, they commented that, in fact, almost any, every election has been so characterized. I come away today um, convinced that we're really at a socio-political and economic crossroads. Uh, this one really is important. Um, and we deserve and really believe um, that we need to have uh, an inspired um, leadership to, to re-inspire our process and to broaden the electorate. Uh, secondly, I think uh, we discovered today that our expectations are extraordinarily high, especially from our next generation. That's high risk, high return. Uh, we better deliver this time. Our leaders better deliver, and we better be sure they do, uh, lest we um, disappoint and, uh, and, and get, as a result, a, a very, very disenchanted uh, new generation. Um, and finally, although we selected 15 questions uh, around this room, or 17, um, I thought it was particularly difficult to do. And I didn't see a bad question in all of them that we considered. Every one of them deserves to be considered by our next president and should be, and we should make sure that that's the case. So um, as a funder um, and as a, a great friend of the center, I want to thank David also and his colleagues and, and Ken for conceiving of this really extraordinarily important exercise. I also want to thank all the participants and remind us collectively um, that we really need to take this exercise to the next step, that we have to take what we've learned here um, and really try to help provide the American people with the uh, leadership, uh, the quality of leadership that they deserve and that they really yearn for now. So thank you, David, and thank all of you participants. Thank you, thank you very much, Richard. And I, I, that is an excellent segue to sort of where do we go from here? Uh, and I, there are three points I want to make. First of all, that. Uh, this was a, uh, even richer session than I had anticipated. Uh, and, and believe me, all the credit for putting this together belongs uh, with a lot of other folks. Uh, and Donna's one of them. Uh, we'll say more about that in just a moment. Uh, but, but you all really brought this to life, too, through your comments, through your efforts, people who are participating in the panels. And I think all of us came away, at least I hope, we came away from this with a sobered view of what is ahead. But also a reason to believe there is there there are opportunities uh, uh, to to go to the Gordy Zacks point. There are opportunities here uh, that we uh, can look forward to. There's a lot of hope in the younger generation. But these questions are very important, and I think to have a conversation, a further conversation in this election campaign is very important. So there's a question now that I think the responsibility rests on us. We would welcome your help, your support, your participation. How do we bring these questions into the arena and pose them to the candidates, put them in front of people so there, this is an exercise that continues uh, and that we really begin to press people? We will explore ways to do that. Uh, the, the, the idea that both candidates are talking about possibly uh, going together into various forums. Uh, in almost Lincoln Douglas fashion, opens up the possibility could we find a sponsor? Could the Kennedy School, could Harvard, for example, sponsor uh, some sort of forum in which leadership would be at the heart of that conversation? And the questions posed here today would form the heart of the, uh, the debate. Could we, look, could we explore that? There are some media uh, avenues that I think we ought to explore. Uh, I'm, in a, yeah, I, I'm in a fortunate position. I think that I can have a serious conversation with CNN, especially with the Anderson Cooper show, to see, because we've talked a lot about once the frenzy of the primaries is over, can we begin to change this conversation to who's, a, who's up, who's down, and to something that's more about the future of the country uh, and the challenges we face and the kind of leadership. And there's a, there's a, there is a, a hunger, by the way, in the country for this conversation. I think Penny George has been telling me for the last 24 hours, people want to have this kind of conversation. And, and I, so there are, there, the questions are, can we take it to others in the media and find whether they would push that to Time Magazine? Time Magazine has shown a great interest for you, as you heard earlier today, in national service. They're going to sponsor a summit on national service in the fall, and good for them. 
Uh, U.S. News, which has heavily, been heavily represented here today, has been a partner with us on many, many projects about uh, designating America's best leaders. That's a possible venue. So we will try to explore that and take it upon ourselves to do that. But I do want you to know that your help, your thoughts, your suggestions uh, in getting that done would also be uh, very, very welcome. Uh, I do want to, I think it's only appropriate, two more things. Uh, our, our dear, dear friend Warren Bennis could not be here today. We, we, we honored him on his 81st, uh, and he's no longer able to travel by plane, or at least not for the time being. He still teaches. He's got a wonderful class on leadership that he teaches at USC. But he did send a note, and I just wanted to share with you just a little bit of the note about what, how he looks ahead uh, and in his and, 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 and Warren's inimitable uh, style. I'll just read you a few excerpts, and they will be on the blog site, and you can find the full, uh, the full note from him. But he said, there are no training manuals to brief the president-elect on the chimerical day one. The problems are infinitely more complex and chaotic, far more consequential and dangerous than any president has faced since FDR or maybe even Lincoln. The condition of the world in this new century could be called global arrhythmia. To, to be even remotely successful, the president will require a great team of diverse advisors, unafraid to level with their boss and each other, valid sources of timely information, and a character comfortable with ambiguity and openness to the unbidden. Even as our new president enters the Oval Office, facing a desk loaded with gnarly and combustible, isn't this Warren, combustible issues and without a reliable map, he or she must be reminded that the most glittering aspirations and insights could be negated in an instant. And I think of Andy Carr delivering that news on 9-11 to the President of the United States. Uh, and, uh, the last section is called No Country for Old Men. It's a, <laughs> what all the candidates must have is an inexhaustible supply of mental and physical energy. When I think about the great leaders I've studied and know, Pete Carroll, USC's remarkable football coach, or the exemplary Bill George come to mind. They are always on, always intense. They never get to say, I don't want to. They have to win on their bad days, as the great pitcher Nolan Ryan once said. They just can't be ready for something. They've got to be ready and prepared for anything. Yes, even that <coughs> 3 a.m. phone call. And if I can be personal for a minute, I mean real personal. I know I've got to finish this blog, my first ever, before morning because I said I would and because I want to. Because I love writing about ideas. Because the topic you are engaging in today is so important. Because I care deeply about the mission of the Center for Public Leadership and its success. The job of the U.S. Presidency dwarfs any other as far as energy, commitment, and desire go. You've got to love it, every minute of it, 24-7. I wish I could be with you today and be part of the conversations, but right now, an airplane for me is no country for old men. <laughs> From our good friend Warren Bennett. <clears throat> and finally, uh, as we thank uh, the Keenan Trust, as we thank the Charles Hotel, and especially as we thank uh, Ken Blanchard and his company. I think it's only uh, fitting, Ken, that we ask, uh, we thank Andy Zalecki who did such a wonderful job and our team at CPL, but symbolic of that, if we could ask uh, Donna Calico and Pat Zergarmi to come up for a moment, we'd just like to thank them personally because they're the ones who really partnered up and did such a grand job uh, doing <coughs> 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 Come up here. This is for you. Come up. Wait, you, you do this. We'll keep. We have one more. <coughs> What's that? Okay, if you, Don, I asked for the whole team because they, they, these folks have been knocking themselves out to pull this together. Where's this? Where's the whole team of everybody from Blanchard and CPL who are here? Okay, great. I want the whole team up here. I want a picture. I want it on TV, whatever it is. And I want to just say, you have, um, we have to turn over this room. So you have a half an hour. 
just to relax, do your blogging. We're going to do the video. Check your email. You can now get wired. Please come back. We've got so much food and such a wonderful, w relaxing evening for you, and we want you back here. Okay? Good. Here's the team. These are folks have been.